Hi, good morning. Uh, this is going to be a series of possibly two lectures on implicit function theorem. Today, what I plan to do is to explain what Im implicit th function theorem is about. Okay, perhaps at the end of the lecture, we will arrive at a statement. Okay, the proof will be attended to tomorrow. If I just start with the statement and the proof, perhaps within 20 minutes I can finish but uh, that won't be of any use. Most important, because it's one of the most useful theorems if you want to go in differential geometry and topology, okay, even analysis. So it's best to understand what the theorem tries to say and have intuitive feeling so that you know where to use it. Okay, only intuition will tell you, oh, this is where I have to use implicit function theorem. Okay, that is the spirit. So we will work towards that. Okay, let me just uh, start sharing. Yeah. So there are two articles of mine on implicit function theorem. One is at essentially BSc level, another one is at uh, MSc level. And both are very good and it, okay, it will give you a good idea about what implicit function theorem is. Please go ahead and download them from that site. Okay. There is also going to be a forthcoming book on analysis and RN. It will have a lot more details. Okay. So let us get started. Okay. Let us start with, as usual, you know, multivariate calculus, I have said time and again, it deals with linear uh, algebra. What do I mean by that? So, so this, what is going to happen in the So, let, let us just look at R, okay? I don't want to get anything. And suppose there is a linear function there is a real okay let us say r into r okay non-zero linear function okay. you say functional if uh, the domain is a field okay codomain is a field okay so you look at w to be the kernel or the set of x in rn so that f of x equals zero notice that yeah any linear function is of the form f dot, okay, summation a x i equal to 1 to n, where this correction a will be to n or n, this is non-zero vector, because this is non-zero function. So, these are known, okay, I don't want to bore you with all these things, okay. Now, this is also clear, this being a kernel, you know this is a vector subspace, okay, w is a vector subspace r. What is this dimension? Again, by rank already, Right? Since f is non zero, therefore f of r will be r of r. Alright? It should be a vector subspace. It's a non zero vector subspace, therefore dimension is 1. And rn, therefore n must be dimension of the kernel of a plus dimension of the image, which is 1. Therefore, we realize this is a minus 1. Okay? This is all very easy. It's triangular right here. But you know, we are not interested in linear algebra, we want to understand some kind of topological geometry intuition. So in general, again if you have gone through my linear algebra book or my lectures on linear algebra, okay, I have an intuitive notion of dimension. What does it mean? How many, suppose I start with the vector w and w, okay, okay, how many coordinates do I need? How many coordinates? I need to locate. These are all vague, don't worry about this, okay? Now, since W is an RN, you will say it's N vectors are needed, but then I don't need that, okay? Why? Because let's assume you, F is given by A summation A X I with A1, A2, A non zero vector. Let's assume A N is not equal to zero. Okay, since a is not equal to 0, okay, with a loss of generality, let me assume a is not equal to 0. That means, if my w is, let us say, x1 to xn in w, right, it satisfies a1 x1 plus a in xn equal to 0. That means, my xn, I don't need anything. If you tell me what are the first n minus 1 coordinates, Okay, I know the nth coordinate. Therefore, to look at W, I need only the first n minus 1 coordinates provided a n is not 0. 
for example, if aj is not equal to 0, that means I will write the xj, the jth coordinate as in terms of other x1, x2, xj minus 1, xj plus 1, xn, the other n minus 1 coordinates. Do all of you agree with that? Yeah? This is something like that. Suppose you want to locate somebody in a street, okay, and there is a multi story building, okay, these are the building, okay, these are the rows, okay, and the person you want is here. Okay, there is a zero through zero through uh, floors. Okay, first floor, second floor, and here is a, let us say two zero three. Right? Then to locate his address, you have to tell me the street name. Once I have the street name, I don't need it. I only need the building name. Okay, or building number. Once I know the building number, I don't need that. I need only the floor. If I know also the floor, if I am on the floor, I need only the door number. You see that? So, to locate this person, okay, if I am in the town, to locate this person in the town, I need four coordinates. I need the street, I need the building name, and then I need the floor, and I don't need the door number. So, if I am, you understand that? If I am already in the street, then I don't need that. I need only three coordinates, namely, building name, floor, and Door number. Do you understand this? Please understand. This is this is a very nice way of looking at dimension, etc. Okay. Now there is another step I want to do that. Okay. So if a j is not equal to zero, I am sure you all of you know. Then x j will be summation one minus one by a j summation a i x i, but i not equal to j. That's it. Okay. So there are two things you can see. The first thing is, so this set W is given by a linear condition. This is a linear condition. Okay. So once I give a linear condition, the dimension of W drops down, goes down by one. One linear condition. Do you understand this? Yeah. The earlier it was in R M. I okay. The dimension of this goes down by one. And not only that, and the original thing, the system of coordinates, I needed x1 to xn coordinate, okay. Now, let me again assume a not equal to 0, for simplicity sake, therefore my xn is a function of other coordinates x g1 to gn minus 1. Namely, I know what the function is, minus an by a1 x1 plus an minus 1 xn minus 1. You understand that? Yeah. So the moment you tell me x1, x2, xn is in W, okay, then I need not only n minus 1 coordinates and the nth coordinate, therefore my x1, this is this can be written as x1 up to xn minus 1 into g of x, x dash, where x dash is, let us say x1 to xn minus 1. Right? In other words, something much more interesting is my w. Now look at, think of this function rn minus 1 to r. So if you give me x1 to xn minus 1, okay, this is going to be my g of x. That is namely minus a1 a1 x1 plus an minus 1 xn minus 1. Right now, I can look at the graph of this. Graph of G is set of elements x, y in R n minus one cross R, which is same as R n, so that y is g of x. Maybe I will call it x dash, so that since it will be x dash, g of x dash. Right now, what is this? This is nothing other than W. Okay. Pause. Review. Proceed. Okay. So, what I have achieved now? I put a non trivial linear condition on the set of vectors. So, this W is a set of vectors which satisfies a linear condition. Okay, 
I am assuming the linear condition equal to zero. That doesn't matter. We will come to it. Okay. Then what did I point? Two things I found. What did I point? The set W is in some sense n minus one dimensional. Not only that. Okay. The last coordinate can be written as a function of the earlier the earlier n minus one coordinates. And third, the set W itself can be realized as the graph of a function. This is all we have seen. Okay. If you understood, okay, then you will be great. The, okay, you will be able to appreciate implicit function theorem very nicely. Okay, please review. Don't shock. Don't think these are all easy. So I don't want to waste my time. Please go through it again. Okay. Now let's come back to my second point. Those who have seen my videos. And I read my articles about multivariate calculus. You know, I think of derivative as a first order linear approximation. That is, if you have, suppose e is from R n to R. Okay, let us assume this is differentiable for at present, and e is in u. Then, if it is differentiable, the derivative of d a is is a is a linear map from R to R. Okay. And we think of this. It's the same differentiable. It's the same as saying for x near to a. Okay. In fact, for all x in a, u, the power is approximately equal to the power of a plus d of a in times x minus a. D of a is a linear map. This is a vector. Therefore, I'll write it down. Okay. For x in. A. And this approximation is error, etc. I do not get into that. You should. You should go back to my earlier videos and see that. Okay, I can't keep repeating again and again. Is all right? Now, what do I want to say? What do I want to say is the following. Suppose now, see earlier case, you look at that. What I had was a function f. Okay, from R n, the entire vector space to R, and what kind of function is a linear function? Of course, we assume non-zero. Okay. Now, suppose I have A function f, okay, from u to r n, sorry to r, which is differentiable, and let's assume this non-constant, okay, right, and uh, we again, if you want to assume, let us use some connected etc. Let's not get into technicalities first, okay. But first, we will get the flavor of what the theorem is trying to say. Then I can look at the set. Okay, call it omega. Okay, may I let me call it yes. That is set of x in u such that f x equal to zero. Notice that this f need not be linear. You understand this? It could be something like okay, a non-linear function which you have seen in our earlier videos, right? So what I would like to say under suitable conditions, I would like to say this is an n-minus one dimension. Whatever it may mean, are it? Like we saw, W is n minus one dimensional. And second, okay, let us assume that my U is this, okay, and this is my A. Then I can find an open set, call it B containing A, right? And this is the set of points. Let me assume F of A, A belong to this, right? Then this is my part of this is my yes. Okay, set of solutions on which the function vanishes. It need not be zero; it could be any constant also. But they are all easy. Let's not worry. You understand this? Okay. Now what do I want? I want to say that locally, that is locally meaning there is an open ball around A, and look at this portion. Let me just use a different color. Only this portion, okay. That is the open ball B A or intersection. Yes, it need not be open ball. I am just saying something, okay. This one is actually graph, okay. On this, okay, I want to say every point here, yes, okay, is a part. I can write one of the variables as a function of other variables. See. Here, how many things? X equal to x and x n, right? I want to say. Let us assume. I want to write x n 
as a function of other variables gx dash where x dash is as usual x1 to xn minus 1. This is local that is I can express okay one of the variables as a function of other variables under suitable conditions we have to understand how to arrive at it but I am just giving you the goal do you understand this you are given non-linear function okay just to make sure that you are on let us look at a simple case before we go further okay suppose I have a function here from r to r right now let me say f of x y equal to x square plus y square plus 1 or y square equal to minus 1 right therefore what is my s we set up all x y in r2 such that f of x y equal to 0 this is nothing other as you know you will circle right circle of radius 1 with as r in the center right now what do i need take any point for example let us take this point okay then let us look take an open set okay for example take the open set this open set then the intersection is only this arc do you follow that okay if you want you could also take the open set which is open upper half plane if I intersect then what I get is only this portion the upper semicircle right then give me any point here x comma y right do you see that I can write it as x into square root of 1 minus x square where this is a positive square root because y has to be positive not negative okay are you following me please for review proceed so I am not saying the entire is yes, on the entire is the one coordinate will be a function of the other coordinate are you following only locally give me a point around that point I can find an open set okay and intersect it with the set yes then this portion of the set on that one of the coordinates can be written as a function of the other coordinates please pause review proceed Com compare and contrast the last case i said it was global that is on the entire w i can do that okay one of the coordinates is a function of the other coordinates and that to the function is a linear function here what i am saying since I do not know anything about G, I am assuming that, okay, I am sorry, F, I must, I am saying that, take any point A in the set, yes, then I can find an open set in Rn and intersect it with S, so only look at this portion, okay, this open set, intersect with S, on that set, one of the coordinates will be a function of the other coordinates, and hence, this portion of the set and then this portion of the set yes intersection okay let me call some set open set u8 maybe an open ball a contain u a containing u okay this is graph of a function some g we have to say we have to locate this g and say that what it means etc but first try to understand what the theorem tries to say Okay. Right. Now, how do I put a condition? Do you think I can always do that? That yeah. That's of course nonsense because if f is a constant function, let us say f is identical to zero function, yes will be all of you. Then I don't get lower dimension. Do you understand? Like here, if my f is a zero linear function, then my w is all of R. So diamond reduction trap. So in some sense it should be non-trivial. Okay. Now what do you think the correct condition should be? Remember what did I say? For me the derivative is a first order linear approximation to the function. Right? So I want this F to be non-trivial. So what should I do locally? The result is going to be local. Therefore, what should we expect? You should expect D of A because the local approximation of A, namely the, the linear map D of A should be non-zero. You understand that? Yeah? So the condition we should impose is 
that d of k from r n to r is not real. That means what? Now remove a d of k, or if you should know, this is given by the gradient of k of t a dot h. That is del f by del x1 at a del f by del x1 at a dot product of h2 to h2. Okay, we are dealing with r n, right? And back to this case. Yeah. Therefore, d of k is non-zero. Is same as saying one of the this partial derivative is non-zero at the point a. You follow that? Yeah. So again, with the loss of generality, assume del f by del x n at a is non-zero. Therefore, this is d of k is non-zero. Right? You understand? So this is the condition. So let's go back. What I am going to show now? Let me assume f from u from r n to r is differentiable. Okay. Let us look at. Assume that a is such that f of a equal to zero. Okay. Assume f a in u such that f of a equal to zero. Now form the set S yes. set of all points x in u such that f of x equal to zero. In particular, a is going to be there. I want to say it's indubitably an n minus one dimensional object. To say that, okay, guided by the two facts. In the linear case, I understood what it means. And second thing is, I know what is the de significance of derivative. Derivative is a first order. This derivative, okay, it gives rise to first order polynomial that is going to be approximately equal to f(x). Okay. Therefore, that second condition I want to say is that the derivative d of k is non-zero. In this case, you can also say non-singular because what is the what is the maximum possible rank of d of k? Only one. So I want when you say it's non-singular, it means maximum possible rank. Okay, right. Therefore, the maximum possible rank, okay, it's a granted. Okay, since the derivative is given by the gradient, what I am going to assume? Okay, one of the partial derivative is not zero. So, for simplicity, let us assume the last derivative is not zero. Then, what is that I want to do? What? Okay. Then, this extra condition. This is not only condition. I have to further assume. Okay. Okay. These functions are continuous. That is, this is the function f is c one. That is, f going to d of y d x i. Okay. That is. Or continue on u for more than or equal to than or equal to u. Okay, not only differentiable, we also put extra condition. These are continuous partial derivatives. Okay. So under this assumption, what is that I want to prove? I I want to prove the x and coordinate will be a function of the other coordinates. X one takes some value. If x one takes some belong to Yes, okay. Intersection, some open set which contains it. It may not be all. Okay, only locally I want to write it as. Please keep going. Do not be worried about too much of thing. Okay. You don't need rigorous. No, you just have to get the get into the skin of the state. Okay, you have to understand the spirit. Then you will appreciate this. Do you understand this? The, now something is very interesting. Let's look at the earlier case, linear case. The linear case, if I f of x equal to a one x one plus a n x n, okay. If if a one to a n is not zero, if a j is not equal to zero, then we said x j is a function of x one x j minus one x j plus one x n. Yeah. What was this a j? Note that this is nothing other than partial derivative of the function at the point. At okay, j to partial derivative is a j. So if j to partial derivative is not zero, then the j to coordinate is a function of other n minus one variables. Okay, please pause, review, proceed.
Okay. Right. So let's try to understand in the case which I did f from r to r. My function was f of x y equal to x squared plus y squared minus one. Now let me take a point here. Okay. Suppose I take a point here. Right. Now there are two ways of doing. Okay. Either I can take the upper half plane. Okay. And intersect it. Therefore, I have this. Or I can take the right side of the plane, and therefore, I can take this. Do you understand this? This point corresponds to the upper half plane, right? If I have taken this, why do I do that? If it is here, let us look at del of by del x. Let us call this point A B, or cos theta sin theta. Okay. This is. This will be. 2a, 2b. The way I have written, you can see a is also not zero, b is not zero. You understand that? You understand? Oh, sorry, this is gradient. I have sorry. Del of at a b is two times a b. Therefore, del of by del x is 2a, and del of by del y is also 2a, and this is not equal to zero because I am taking the point in the open first quadrant. Right. Now you can see. So my in the first quadrant, okay, the upper upper thing, okay. If I take the upper thing, okay, this is set up all x y y positive. Then u h intersection. This this is my yes. Okay, f inverse of zero my yes. Okay. That is nothing other than this. This is u h intersection is. Whereas you can define u r to be set of x y, where x is positive, then this will be u r intersection. Do you understand this? Yeah. What I am going to show is very easy. So now suppose my x y belong to this. U H intersection is right. Then what did I know? I said, okay. You follow that? Okay. I what I can do is I can write Y as a function of the square. And this as usual part is square root. Okay. Whereas when X Y belong to U R intersection is, then I can write X as a function of Do you follow this? Right. And notice that this is going. To, this is called this as a function g1 of x. This function as g2 of y. Then u h intersection s is graph of g1. And u r intersection s is graph of g2. And what is the domain? Domain is going to be open row minus one to one. Okay. G J is a domain from R to R. Okay, G one of X is square root of one minus X squared, where X runs from minus one to plus one over. And similarly, G two of Y is square root of one minus Y squared, where Y runs from minus one to plus one. Please look at that. Please understand all these things. Okay, this is the simplest case, it, but then it explains the real part. Now you may wonder, can I write? X as a function or Y as a function of all things? No, I can't do that because if you give me an X here, okay, there are two Y which correspond to that. There are two points, and then I have two choices: square square root of one minus X squared plus or minus. You understand that? Either I do should take this point, or whether I should take this point is not clear. But if I restrict myself only to the upper half plane, I know I have to take square root of one minus X squared. Positive square root. If I restrict myself to lower hemisphere, lower half plane, okay, then I know I have to take only minus of square root of minus of square. Please think, take some time. My art, one of the articles explain these things in little more detail because they are written for B.Sc students. Please go through it. Okay, right. So what is what is that? What is the takeaway? What is the intuition you have got so far? 
So if u of u is u is a function from r to r, let me assume it's a c1 function. Let us assume u is in a and f of a is 0 and then form the set x in u such so that f x equal to 0. Assume that the gradient f at a is not 0. In particular, with a loss of generality, let us assume that del f by del x n at a is not equal to 0. Then what you have shown is, or what we feel is, there exists u a open in R n. Okay, so that a belong to u a and that is contained in u. And, okay, then for all x in u a intersection is, that is x equal to x m, okay, x m is a function of x dash. Okay, we have to specify the domain, we will do that. Okay, so this is what we plan to do. Okay, but there is one more thing. Say what I have shown is, I have done the second part of the linear case. That is, my W is a graph of, here it is a global result. Do you remember that? In the first case, W is a graph of a function from Rn minus 1 to R. This is a global result. Whereas here it is a local result. Why? You fix a point, around that point, okay, the part of the thing, the surplus, like S is for surplus, okay, in the higher dimension, you think of it as a surplus. Okay, for example, you get from R3 to R, f of x, y, z, is x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 1, then this is going to be a sphere. Yeah? It's a sphere. Therefore, you think of this S as a surface, even though I will be drawing pictures in two dimensions, that is why I call S. Okay? So, the dimension should draw. For that, what do we need? We need the derivative at that point A should be non singular. Then, locally, okay, this is my UA, this is my S, and there is my A, then there is a thing. This portion, okay, for each point, I can write it as a. Each, okay? For each point, one of the coordinates can be written as a function of other coordinates. And notice that the function need not be linear. Look at that, 1 minus 6 squared and then you are taking square root. So it will be non-linear general, in general. Yeah? So there is one more thing. Okay? With that I will stop. I talked about dimension. Do you remember? In the case we said about dimension, I would like to understand this a little more. Suppose I have f from Rn to R linear as usual, okay? f of a is equal to let us say x dot a, summation a i x i, right? Then suppose c is a constant, real number. Then I can look at w, let me call it s, equal to set of all x in Rn, so that f x equal to c. Yeah. Notice that this is called a hyperplane. Okay. The picture is something like this. Again, I will be drawing this is my Rn. This is I'm sorry the picture may be difficult for you to draw. This is through zero. This is a minus of zero. Set up all x such so that x dot a equal to zero. And this will be something like parallel. This is f equal to c. This is my w. Right? So what you do is it's just a translate. You fix one vector x in W. Okay, this is called as W0. Then W is nothing other than x plus W0. Therefore, we call dimension of W as same as this, and this we are defining. Notice that this is not a vector space. W may not be a vector space if C is non zero. So dimension of W is zero. Alright? So you think of x y plane that is z equal to 0, I move it to z equal to 1. Then that's also a plane in your periods 1 and 2 I'm showing. You understand that? Yeah, because I need only two coordinates. The z coordinates are always constant. Are you following? For example, if I have ax1 plus axn, a and xn equal to c, okay, and suppose a is not equal to 0, 
Okay, then I know how to write x, x, x on coordinate that is c, right? Equal to c, that was this minus c equal to 0, that was c minus a1 x1 plus em minus 1 xm minus 1 by a as minus. Yeah, how do all of you follow that? Is there a minus? No. A and x and yeah. So a and x and equal to that is equal to c minus this I write on the a. Sorry, there is nothing. Yeah. So again x n is going to be a function of n minus one variables only. This is a constant number, so it's actually a function of x one x n minus one. And therefore I think of this dimension of w, even though it's not a vector subspace, I think of this dimension as a di n n minus one. Because it's just a translate of n minus one dimension vector subspace. Do you understand? Yeah. Now let's we, I want to extend the notion of dimension to open sets in R. Suppose you use an open set in okay, in some R capital. Okay. No, so, so, sorry. Suppose S is a subset in R capital N. It's a subset. Assume as usual non empty. Okay. I want to talk about dimension of this. Yeah. How do I do that? The way to do that, so notice that this L may be like this. Okay. In R, this may be like this. For example, the circle sitting in R2, right? R hyperbola sitting in R2, rectangle hyperbola, right? You follow that? Okay, it need not even be open. Please have pay attention. My set is, yes, I am not even assuming it's an open set, it's just a set. Okay, but I want to talk about dimension. Okay? I say dimension of where, okay? Dimension of where is equal to k. Here, there exists an open set. Okay. Open set B in RK and a homeomorphism. Phi from B to S. You follow that? Let's again go slow, let's understand. Suppose let's look at, okay, yeah, let my S, okay, be in R2, should be set of x, y, such that y equal to x squared. R, you know, this is a hyperbola. Okay, and I want to say, this is a dimension. Okay, right? We will come to that as a specific example. Let's look at that, phi from R, to yes I have map x going to x comma x squared. You can check this a volume also. Yeah. This is going to be a, a special case of what we are going to do with soon. Okay, just go through this. Right? There is a very technical issue, some some kind of well defined that is Maybe there is a open set W in some RL and a homeomorphism to S. Right? This is a homeomorphism. Whereas this is a W is an open set in R. Then, according to this definition, you would like to call dimension of S to be L. Whereas, according to the earlier definition, somebody may call it the dimension is K. Okay? Notice that if S is homeomorphic to W and B is homeomorphic to W, then sorry, B is homeomorphic to S, then by transitivity we will know B is homeomorphic to W. Right? So this will imply B is homeomorphic to W. But there is a theorem called invariance of domain. That's a very deep theorem in algebraic topology. What it says is if V is open in RK and W is open in RL and V is homeomorphic to W, then K equal to L. Okay? Therefore, our definition of dimension is well defined. 
Yeah? Right. Now I'll, the last part of the game, I have finished this. Okay, what I want to do. Suppose X and Y are topology spaces. F is a continuous map from X to Y. Okay, then let's look at the gra graph. Graph of your. This is set up all x y in x cross y so that y equal to f x. Okay. Now call this as yes, therefore this is subspace topology from the product topology. Right? So this is also topology space. Now I'm saying x is homeomorphic. Yes. There's an obvious homeomorphism. Look at that, whenever you want some kind of isomorphism, homomorphism, homeomorphism, continuous map, what you should look for is, is there a natural map? Can you think of a natural map from X to S? The obvious map is map X to X comma F of X. Right? Now, and this sits in X as Y. Right? And the map Y from X to X as Y, this is a continuous map because using the product topology, Okay, this map is continuous if only the coordinate maps are continuous. Okay, what is the coordinate map I want? That is x going to x identity map. The second coordinate map is x going to f y that is from x to y that is given to be continuous. Therefore, this is a continuous map. And it is clearly a bijection. Right? And what is the inverse map? Inverse map is obvious namely going to x okay this is finally and this is a projection map notice that this sits in x plus y and projection maps are continuous and i restrict to s therefore that map is also continuous right therefore pi is a homeomorphism do you understand this have yeah, pause review proceed now go back to what i said here i succeeded in climbing what i said earlier okay let f be from u to r c1 function so that f of a is 0 form the surface s so that set of all x in u so that f is equal to 0 and assume the gradient of f at a is non zero namely the last nth partial coordinate is non zero then i want to say there is an open set u a in r n so that u a intersection is just a graph of some function Right? Okay. The suppose the domain of G is an open set in Rn. Notice that this is graph of x1 to xn minus 1. Okay, therefore these are vectors coming from some Rn minus 1. So if the domain of G is an Rn minus 1, it's an open set in Rn minus 1, then what can I conclude? This portion of the set, namely UA intersection S, yes. okay, this portion. Okay, according to our definition, we'll have n minus 1 dimension. Okay, please go through. Do not be discouraged by this kind of way thing because with the too much of rigor, nowadays teachers feel very uncomfortable to give this idea. But remember, our forefathers, our earlier mathematicians, arrived at this theorem by thinking geometrically, intuitively, then making it rigorous. So only going through a proof will not make you understand what are the motivation for the proof, what it really tries to say. Okay. And we will meet again in the, in the next lecture. We will come up with a proof of this. Okay. I will stop recording. Stay tuned.